You ready? I'm ready. You ready? ready. All right. We got Lisa. Okay. Where's Lisa? Where's Lisa? She's coming. <laughs> All right, we got to go. Yeah. Yeah. Make sure. Okay. Left first. I'll take your lead. Crown her. Crown her. Yeah. Like her. Aloha. <laughs> okay, ready? Let's go. but we can pretend. <laughs> so we're welcome. We're so welcome. We're so glad you're here this morning with us here in the sanctuary and also online. Please uh, fill out your connect card if you're here so that we can know how we can support you. Um, and we would love to have you. Just as I mentioned, 2023 is coming and the youth have calendars so that you can keep track of all the birthdays and all the stuff that's coming. Pecans are also for sale out in the uh, cafe area and our uh, blood drive bus is here too. Please note the Christmas Eve services, the Christmas Day and New Year's Day services in your uh, bulletin and uh, we look forward to worshiping together this morning. Good morning. Please stand. We're going to sing a song called Hope Was Born This Night by Sidewalk Prophets because hope was born the night that Christ came down. Sky. 
It's the same that appeared and the wise men revered when hope was born this night. Out upon the snowy fields, there's a sign of peace that heals. It's an echo of the grace of our Savior's embrace. join the big kid on the stage that would be great oh, oh, oh. can i sit right there all right thanks appreciate it sammy you got green from what rainbow friends charlotte you're packing what is that is that like luggage or what is that that's it no no that's a game hi look at this santa's helper joined us what do you think wow i like a guy who comes up here prepared with an open mind <laughs> you both have the same natural We do. Yeah. His is like, I don't know, peach, and mine is blues. All right. Well, it's good to have everybody up here. Well, you know, that's what I said, but they made me come. <laughs> wow. So I want to talk to you about a scripture this morning. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for Christmas? You're ready for football. So who do you want to win, Ohio State or the Bulldogs? <laughs> Ohio State. You and me, we're praying hard, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Number one versus number four. God. I've seen him do it before. He could pull it out. Never know. And I'm, I'm talking about God, not... <laughs> you know, I can't remember his name. That's how bad I am. Where's the treasure box? Yeah? Where's the treasure box? Do you remember the treasure box? <laughs> Nowhere to be seen. That's exactly it. So I want to teach you a verse. Are you ready? Let me get my eyes on. See, if you get old like me, you get to wear these. All right. So Matthew 10. Matthew 10. 29 to 31. 29 to 31. Pretty good. Okay. A bird. A bird. Could be. Cannot fall. 
cannot fall. Without the Father. Without the Father. Knowing it. Knowing it. So. So. Don't be afraid. Don't, don't be afraid. You are more valuable. You are more valuable than any bird. Than, than any, any bird. bird. Isn't that a cool verse? <clears throat> No, oh, yeah, okay, no. All right, so let me convince you how cool it is. There's, there's, uh, have you ever been discouraged or afraid? Never? Never in your life? Not even when he was in the hospital? That's what I'm saying. So you weren't, you weren't afraid? Yeah, you were a little bit afraid because you guys have been connected. You guys have been connected since the womb. You know that? Oh, the needles make me cry too. Yeah. I know. The hurtfulest needle was the one that they put in my foot. The hurtfulest needle. I like the way you master the English language. You're going to be a preacher one day. You are. JD's, I bet you were. So, but we all get scared sometimes. We do. Some things that. I wasn't scared. You weren't? Were you lonely? You were in that room all by yourself? Welcome. All right. Shots do hurt. What's the matter with you? <laughs> so, in fact, some cheap shots hurt when somebody <laughs> criticizes you or something like that. That kind of hurts, too. Oh, let me tell you a story real quick. Are you ready for a quick story? He got shot in the leg by a rifle? Do you think that hurt? Me and my brother's dad got blown up. In the arm. I remember with an IED. With a, grenade. a grenade. It hurt, didn't it? It hurt for a long Okay, I have lost control. All right, all right. So there was somebody who went to visit some friends of theirs, and they went to visit thinking they were going to encourage them. In fact, the, the name of the couple they went to visit was Doolittle. You ever heard the word Doolittle before? No. Dr. Doolittle. But this is somebody else. Snickerdoodles. This is somebody else too. Dave, you may be gone till noon. Uh, anyway, so they went to visit, and here's the deal. Mr. Doodle was in a wheelchair and had been and would be for the rest of his life. And his wife was in the bed and couldn't get out. So she, he, he thought that he was going there to encourage them. But instead, they encouraged him because they were really cheerful and happy and sort of out of control, just like us. Yeah. You know, it was so much fun that they, she went home and she wrote a poem. And it reads like this. Listen. She asked Mrs. Doolittle, how do you manage to remain so joyful when you guys face so many problems? Do you face any problems? You know, I'm going to pull the grandma card in about one second. <laughs> so she wrote this poem, and it goes like this. Listen, why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? That's fear or doubt or disappointment. Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, in other words, you've trusted Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. A constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches over me. So this little guy doesn't seem very important, does he? I mean, think about it. He, he's your pet? So he's really important to you? You know, the nice thing, nicest thing about this bird is you can pet him all day long. And he'll never fly away. You don't have to feed him one bird seed because he is an ornament. So what do ornaments do? What do ornaments do? Ornaments hang around the Christmas tree. And here's what I want you to do. Whenever you get nervous or frightened, remember our Bible verse that God, God has his eye on you and you are far more important than any bird in the air. So when you get nervous, when you get nervous or afraid or lonely, think of this bird hanging on the tree and remember that Christ hung on a tree on Calvary's cross so that you would never have to be alone or afraid or frightened. So let's pray. Are you ready to pray? I'm going to have to put this bird away. I can see that back. In, oh, no, no, no. I got to put that back on the tree. <laughs> All right, hands together. Are you ready? Dear God. Dear God. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. For caring for me. For caring for me. No matter what happens. No matter what happens. I know. I know. You will. You will. Take care. Take care. Of me. Of me. All right. Would you guys like. Yeah. I want a green one. All right. Pass. I'm not sure Marilyn gave me enough. If you don't have one. Hey. Don't go yet. I've got some goodies that came from a friend in the church. Oh. Uh, see. Just like God takes care of us. Our church family takes Whoa. care of us. Woohoo! 
Grab one, grab one. Say grab thank one, you. grab one. Remember to yeah. say thank you yeah, to yeah. all of you. Don't thank me. Thank that, that anonymous stranger in the church okay. who will kill me if I out her. All right. I apologize right now to all of the Sunday school teachers. They're going to be juiced up. Anybody else? Anybody out there? You want to share one, somebody? All right. Who are you going to share it with? Oh, very nice. How about you? You going to share? All right. Good catch. Nice. Look at that. Marilyn, he did it again. There's extras. <laughs> all right, Dave, take it away. Good luck redeeming all of that. <laughs> If you'd like to stand and worship with us this morning, if you're able, if you want to sit there and worship, that's fine too. The song is called Peace Is Come. Behold the star. to the king. I'm going to stand on this one because I need to stand because we're hailing to the king. Stand up, stand up. 
Stand up. Stand up. Better from my back angle. Okay. told you these things so that you can have peace because of me. In this world you will have trouble, but be encouraged, I have won the battle over this world. <clears throat> My God, the world seems to crush in around us, but we have peace in your promises and faithfulness. Relationships, pressures of life, and difficulties around us, but fill us with a peace, but you fill us with a peace that surpasses the world's understanding. Your promises are restoration and provision 
of faithfulness and plenty. And I know that I will see these things with my own eyes. I know that if this is the age, I will face many difficulties and many things that will seem tight with little reprieve. But your hope is not in this age, but peace here. Our hope is in you and the coming of your kingdom. Therefore, I am peaceful. Join me in our morning. Uh, <coughs> please join us in the prayer that our Lord gave us. Our Father, our Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy, thy will be done, done on earth, earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily, daily bread, bread, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as we as forgive, forgive those who trespass against us. Against us. And lead us not into temptation, temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Oh, that must be my cue. All right. Well, I want to add my welcome to the welcome that everybody has already received. Today is the fourth Sunday in Advent, and so uh, we will light... Well, first of all, Christ is the light of the world, so I know I forgot to light him last week, but you know what? Jesus is always lit, just so you know. All right, so we have the three, the three purple candles. There we go. And don't forget the shepherd's candle, the third week, all this joy. And today we light the candle of peace, of peace. How many of you experience peace 24-7, 365? <laughs> if you say yes, we'll loan you some grandchildren for a couple of hours. <laughs> but there's some peace that uh, is worth forsaking. The laughter of a grandchild, have you noticed? Isn't that worth, worth uh, forsaking the empty, emptiness of a home? There's some other peace that uh, kind of stretches our imagination. <clears throat> you know, like... Mornings in Florida. <clears throat> I'll get through this in a minute. Read with me Isaiah, the prophet, who said these words. He will be named Wonderful Counselor. Stop, 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 stop. Wonderful. How many of you once in a while just need somebody to listen to you? Amen. So that is Jesus. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Don't ever forget, Jesus is fully man, can identify with everything that's in us and around us, but he is God. Almighty, eternal father, eternal father. Uh, I don't know about you, but I remember uh, my mom died, and then about 10, 12 years later, my dad died, and I had this profound feeling that I had come up to the edge of the cliff, and I was the next one in line. Has anybody have that, or is that just me? Is that weird? Yeah, it's just me. All right. Yeah, thanks for that, Linda. I appreciate that. <laughs> it's always good to know somebody's got my back. Uh, but no, I mean, you've always had, I don't know about you, but I had a godly mother, and she prayed for me every day. She, she knew me, so she knew she had to pray for me, right? Exactly. Thank you for that. Witness right there. So he is wonderful counselor, always listening, mighty God, always powerful, eternal father. He knows what's best for us. And that leads us to the final title that Isaiah gives the Christ, Prince of Peace. So if you haven't figured it out by now, this weekend... Uh, the fourth Sunday leading into Christmas is going to be peace. We looked at uh, God's plan and God's promises, and then today we're going to look at God's providence. How many of you know what providence is? Don't say a place in New England, okay? <laughs> All right? All right. No, no. Anybody know what providence is? This is an adult study, by the way, so feel free to interact. <laughs> providence. What's that? Destiny, kind of. Yeah, God sees the end. Well, we're still struggling with our past in this moment, but God sees the end. So in that sense, not in the sense of karma or, you know, some other, you know, God and the force of the universe or something like that, but in a sense, it, but it's just this idea that there is this providential care, that God isn't just an idea. It's not that man made up God, but God made man, and God continues to care for us. How many of you realize that if you bring life into the world, you are responsible for them? Yeah, that's called what? Parenthood. Too bad too many people <laughs> have walked away from the hood. All right? So this week, let's look at providence, you know. Uh, and then I want you to think about this. Uh, how many of you know the, wor the, the words to Silent Night? All right, so I want you to think that Christmas is kind of like 
God whispering into this age of anxiety these words. Sing them to yourself. That's not the right clip. Can we stop that? That clip goes at the end of the message. (laughs) So I was talking about anxiety. bright and morning star was born. We're not waiting for Bethlehem's manger to be filled again. But what we desperately need is the peace of God from the Prince of Peace. We need for the Christ to be born in each of our hearts. Now the Christ is born in me, but he must be born in you. The Christ may have been born in your parents or grandparents or people you admired, people who fed hope into your life who protected you but the truth is at the end of the day any human can only protect you so far but God will not only secure your future but inhabit your present and he will redeem your past no matter how wonderful that past or difficult that past was this is the father who came down as the son at Christmas Most of us really strive to feel that peace, that calm of that silent night. But this is what many of us face. We face anxiety. Um, Anxiety is what you feel the night before the big battle. Anybody ever uh, been facing a big decision or uh, maybe you've come to a crisis in your marriage or with your child or grandchild, a neighbor, whatever, and you just get that knot in your stomach. Anybody ever feel that knot in your stomach? Not a good feeling, is it? That is anxiety. Anxiety is what you feel before the big battle, no matter what the battlefield. And fear is what you feel during the fight. But God has another plan for me and for you. We become anxious as we consider what we might lose. Our life, our family, friends, property, reputation, or anything else that you value. That's where anxiety comes from. It's that sense that I'm not secure. It's that sense that I may lose once again. So I I wonder if you've considered Christmas as God's answer to PTSD. What is PTSD? Even the youngest among us, whether in person or online, each of us is experiencing PTSD. Some of us at a much more intense level than others, but all of us have lost something. When a five-year-old loses their kitty that they've known all their life, do you suppose they feel that trauma of that loss? And if you're 100 years old and you're bearing your wife of 70 years, don't you think you feel that loss? And once we've experienced significant loss, once that knot has twisted up our insides and not just our intestines, but our soul, we fear having that knot tied again. But learning to live with our losses is crucial to moving from simply surviving, getting up, getting through, and going to bed to have to do it again tomorrow. God's plan is far more for his children than just to survive our loss. It's to help us thrive once again. How many of you want to thrive once again? I know I sure do. You know, we anesthetize our anxiety. We, we do it with drugs or an activity of our choice. Some of them are prescribed. Some of them are illegal. But when the high is gone or when the vacation ends, 
pretend peace evaporates and we slump back into the reality that we're trying to escape. We have to live with our losses. So we as Christians, as Christ followers, as people of faith, ask, doesn't God care? We, like the disciples, find the Christ asleep in the front of our boat while we're facing the storms in our life. And we, like them, cry out, don't you care that we're about to go under? And the answer is yes. God wants us to join his family and get off the treadmill of the human race. So if this year was basically a repeat of last year, maybe a little better, a little worse, then you still haven't heard, Silent night, holy night. You see, the world around us can be in turmoil, but our heart can be at peace. That's why the RSVP, what does RSVP stand for? Respond, save it blue. You know, I'm teaching the young people because I'll put RSVP on stuff and they're like, what's that mean? <laughs> uh, it means that not only do you write a thank you card when you go, it means that you tell them you're coming. That way you know how much chicken cordon bleu to make, just so you know, okay? Uh, but the RSVP that God wants us to respond to is Christmas, Bethlehem's manger. For he was born with a purpose, and that purpose is to do what? To save mankind. So you must respond. Just because Christmas happened for the world doesn't mean Christmas has necessarily happened for you. And God desperately wants you to be, or wants to be your heavenly father. Not just God, not just a philosophy, certainly not a religion. He wants to be your heavenly father. You know, Paul teaches his protege how a godly man is to care for his family. Read it with me, would you? First Timothy. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. You know, that is a reflection of God's desired relationship with each of us. If you think into that and feel into that, you understand why he's known as our Heavenly Father. When Jesus was asked, how should we pray? He said, pray in this manner, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Providential care is when the Heavenly Father takes care of you, even when you don't realize he's doing it. Albert Einstein said, Coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. Isn't that cool? So for those of you who want to split hairs on theology, the one who split the atom, who taught us the formulas necessary to do that, while he remained deist, understood. But a sparrow doesn't fall to the ground that there isn't a providential force that cares. So... In ancient Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament, there really was no word for coincidence. And yet I hear all the time in Christian circles, well, that's a coincidence. No, I think it was a God incident. Turn to your neighbor and say, I've seen a God incident. But most of the time, we just thought, because God chose to remain anonymous, it was just chance. It was just fate. But in fact, it was your heavenly father. His divine guidance and care is called providential planning. And he cares for you as his child. Jesus teaches us practical providence in Matthew 6, 25. Just listen. I'm going to ask you to join me and, uh, on the yellow words. Can you, anybody colorblind? You don't have to raise your hand, okay? <laughs> when everybody else starts reading, you read too, Okay. <clears throat> Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. Well, it's the only life I got, right? Right? So what's he saying? Is a guy on wacky tobacco here? So do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink. How many of you, once you retired, that became the primary part of your conversation? You're eating lunch. Where are we going to go for dinner? Right? Yeah, I know. I know about blue light specials. You know, I retired once. I failed, but that's a different story. Uh, what you eat or drink or about your body. If you don't take care of your body, who's going to? 
Because by the time you ask the medical team to intervene, it's because something's gone wrong. So he's not saying take a laissez-faire approach to life. We're called and empowered to be responsible human beings. And don't worry about, you know, wearing Prada, okay? <laughs> Is not life more than food? Do you agree with that? Mm, that was weak. Is life not more than food? Yes, yes it is. And, uh, and the body, isn't it more than clothes? Yeah, you can hide a lot of defects with clothes. You can't. I wish people ho hid a little more defects because Victoria's Secret's not anymore. I just, you know. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? I want you to think about that. I want you to let that soak into your soul. Don't bounce off of it. Don't say, oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard that. No, 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 no. I don't care that you've heard it. I want you to feel it. I want you to step into that reality because that is providential care right there. That's what Jesus is teaching. He's telling us uh, not to take a carefree approach to life. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying that when we understand how important we are to God, we can relax and trust him, no matter what the process, no matter what the outcome. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm important to God. And you are. If you walk away from here with nothing else than that, then you will walk away a changed person. Providential care is God working his plan, his will, around the choices we make. Do we always make choices that please God? Does he write us out of his plan? No. So providential care takes into account when we get it right and when we get it wrong and when we sit on the fence post. Understanding this will of God leads to peace of mind. You know, there was a guy who started the Menninger Institute, um, Carl Menninger, who said, if it were not for the local church, there are not enough psychiatrists to handle the psychoses of America. I'm not here to teach you psychology, but I am here to remind you that your heart, your mind, your character, your life, your joys and your sorrows all fit within God's providential plan. So you don't have to remain lonely. You don't have to remain confused. You don't have to remain angry. You can find silent night, holy night. Even while you're waiting behind that guy here at 512 and US 1 who's missed two yellow lights in a row. I'm not saying you don't hit the horn a couple times, but I am saying <laughs> you can do it with peace. There are plenty of moments that we just don't know why things happen the way they do. Would you agree? Yeah. Amen. But God uses his word and his messengers. How many of you believe in the word of God? How many of you believe? We taught on angels a few weeks ago. How many of you believe there are angels? Both God's word and God's messengers, prophets and angels, are used by God to help clarify his divine and unfolding plan. So whether you like it or not, angels are secret agents of God's providence. How many of you fly or drive faster than your guardian angel can fly? <laughs> I've seen a few of you, okay? You know, Santa may, may be making a list. <laughs> But when you check out, God is going to check the one list that matters, the Lamb's Book of Life. Will you have your name written eternity, or will it be erased? I've always wondered, how in the world can I be in heaven in eternity without family and friends, people desperately important to me, and I know that God's got a way. It's part of his providential plan. And I know that there is a, oh, a branch of Christian theology kind of, wackadoo, but it's there. Jehovah's Witness, they believe in the annihilation of the soul. It's as if you never existed. If that's true or not, I don't want to spend eternity anywhere but with Jesus. How about you? Amen. Amen. That is the point of Christmas. In the Christmas story, there are three angelic visits. Each one, God is showing up through one of these secret agents to either strengthen someone's faith or to reveal their next step so that they can further God's plan. Yet he never shows the entire playbook. It's, it's kind of annoying when you play football and the coach micromanages from the sideline. 
you know, because, you know, the, the quarterback's always looking over there, and you wonder whether, well, I never wondered. My job was to own six feet in front of me and to knock anything down that was standing up. <laughs> My job was simple. But I wouldn't want to be a quarterback. God is not micromanaging his creation or you. But God is sending people in with a place when they're critically important. Does that make sense? Three angels, three scenes. Who's on the left? Mary in the Annunciation. Who's in the middle? Joseph. I like those pictures because Mary's young and Joseph's old, and that's the real story. And on the right, who do you see? The shepherds in a field guarding their flocks by night. Three angels, three scenes, all of them furthering God's plan, his providential plan. So let's step into that first scene at the Annunciation. How will this be, Mary asks, since I'm a... Seems to be a problem. I think it's a good thing. Ladies online, you know, if you're young, unmarried, forget this hookup culture. It's not about a body count. It's about understanding your body as a temple. And then when the right guy comes along, that temple will be the most beautiful thing you two can explore together. How will this be, Mary asks, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so the Holy One to be born will be called what? The Son of God. The Son of God. God is unfolding His providential plan and not just 2,000 years ago in a little town called Bethlehem. He's unfolding His plan and giving clarity to each of us not just in a confusing situation like a virgin birth but in the confusing situation you find yourself in. Many of you right now are doing things you never thought you'd be called upon to do. Many of you right now have outlived the plans that you had for your life. I never expected to make it to 21. <laughs> and we turned 63 in a couple of weeks. Ha, ha, ha. You, you're there eight days ahead of me. Ha, ha. <laughs> so for eight days, I get to say, the old gray mare just ain't what she's... <laughs> And so for eight days, you'll see me sporting a black eye, okay? <laughs> God is unfolding his providential plan and giving some clarity to what will be not just Mary and Joseph's confusing situation, but ours. We have our hopes and dreams, but as John Lennon said, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. How many of you find that to be true? The Bible says it this way, just so you know, I'm not hanging this sermon on, a, on an atheist, but uh, <laughs> uh, read it with me, would you? Proverbs 16. We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. It's both wise and prudent. It's a requirement for the Lord to use the brain that he get, God gave you to bring the best good into your life and the lives of those who depend upon you and are around you. God gave us free will to make wise, not poor, choices. But ultimately, no matter what we choose, our will cannot trump God's will. No matter whether you've played your hand that life has given you well or very poorly, at the end of the day, if you trust that God is going to carry you through, you will have a winning hand. So for those of you waiting for a, a godly spouse, don't lower your standards. Trust God's plan. To those stuck in a job with no other Christians, I know it's hard to go to work and be the lone voice of reason and justice and holiness and mercy and love. But hang in there. Trust God's plan. To those struggling in your health or finances, trust God's what? He is your Heavenly Father. Discover God's principles. I mean, God will always bad clean up, but the truth is He wants you to get on first base. He wants you to advance the runners on the bases, your children and grandchildren, your friends and coworkers, your neighbors. What you and I do matters. And the more you understand God's playbook, the Bible, the more you understand what God is trying to do in your life, not just through the easy things, but the hardest things, then you will be like Mary, who faced an impossible situation 
but came through because she followed her heavenly father. Scene two. Joseph, Joseph's a man. He's a man. He's a man's man. He's, you know, well thought of. He's righteous. He's done it right all his life. And now he's facing a moment where he must do it wrong. And that's hard. Sometimes when things seem right to us, when they seem just, when what we're sure is going to be the most merciful and faithful thing we do, and God nudges our soul, bumps our ego, and says, no, I, I know what you think, but this is what I need you to do. Take one for the team. So Joseph discovers his wife is pregnant, and he, above anyone else, knows it's not his child. And he chooses to take the high road and quietly divorce her. But it's not God's plan. So God has an angel visit Joseph in a dream and he reveals the truth. God's truth, his providential plan, as crazy as it seems, as difficult as it is, that problem pregnancy was God's plan. I wonder what problem that you're facing right now that's part of God's plan and you want to take a vacation, and you want to anesthetize the pain or the confusion through drugs or something else. And God says, no, 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 trust me. Step into this mess. I know it's a red-hot mess, but I want to tell you I'm a red-hot Savior. God wants to save you. Matthew one twenty, An angel of the Lord appeared in a dream. Joseph, do not be afraid. How many of you have ever been afraid? I asked the kids, how about you? Are you as honest as those kids? They said, no, I've never been afraid. And I knew J.D. had spent time in the hospital. I knew that his brother, his twin Sammy, was scared to death. When somebody asks you, I mean, you've been in a car accident, your left hand is cut off, you're bleeding out, you know, your right hip is broken, you're standing there, you know, how are you doing? What's your answer going to be? I'm fine. I'm fine. Every one of us in this room and online is not fine. We are all living with PTSD. We all have experienced loss. Many of us have experienced losses we thought we couldn't live with. So he's not just saying to Joseph, then and there, he's saying to you here and now, do not be afraid to take this road that is difficult and is confusing. Take the next step, and I'll give you the strength to take another. So what is conceived in her is from who? The Holy Spirit. How do you not know that this difficulty is part of God's plan to build your character. Did you know God is far more interested in your character than he is your comfort? And yet the church seems to have flipped that over, saying it's all about comfort and being nice and playing nice instead of growing up in Jesus Christ. She will give birth to a son. The question is, Joseph, do you want to be part of that story? And name him Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their what? So when, Jesus, when Joseph wakes up, he understands God's plans better and obeys. The truth is, for those of us who think if we understood one more thing, if we had one more piece of knowledge, then we would be faithful. The truth is, no, you would not. The Bible is clear. Until we're faithful in the small things, we don't stand a shot of being faithful in the big and the difficult things. So he takes a step of faith, even though he knows what that's going to mean. What word from God do you need today to respond to like Joseph did and trust that God is at work in your life, trying to order your steps, even when they go against your plans? Oh, no, Jerry, that's not my idea of Christianity. I fit God in where I can. I fit Jesus in where it makes sense, where there's an advantage for me. Friends, because our vision, our perspective is limited, we question what God is doing in our lives. It was no different for Joseph or Mary. It took a, a word from God to convince them that that red-hot mess of a virgin birth would somehow lead to the salvation of who? All of mankind. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Read it with me, would you? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will direct your path. Maybe getting arrested was the first step in getting the help you need. 
Perhaps that unexpected health crisis is really a wake-up call that you need to begin living a healthy lifestyle and taking seriously that your body is a temple of God bought with the price of Calvary's cross. You know, when I retired in 2018, Lisa and I moved to Indiana to take care of her mom to help her get back on her feet after she lost the love of her life. And after we pulled in the docks and the boats from the lake and after I'd fixed everything my brothers and sisters would let me fix, uh, and they'd close the door. I had, Jerry, there's no other projects. You've already remodeled the bathroom. You've already, you know, remodeled the living room. No, no, nothing. I'm like, what do I do now? And so I saw an ad for a chaplain at Parkview Hospital. And I'm not wired to be a chaplain, but I got excited. See, I like to come alongside people's lives. I don't like to show up uh, in... in seminary, I did a thing, a CPE, Clinical Pastoral Education at UK Medical Center at the VA Oncology Ward, and I loved ministering to the, to the vets in the beds, uh, struggling with all kinds of cancers, but the hardest thing for me is I'd come in, and the bed would be empty, and so I'd pull the chart, and they died in the night. Even more jarring, I'd come in after, you know, ministering to somebody, getting to know him and his family, his story, and there'd be a new face in the bed. So I knew I wasn't wired to be a chaplain, but I saw this job. It seemed like a lifeline from God. And after all, Parkview Hospital started out as Methodist Hospital. (laughs) So I figured surely this was God's plan for my life. And so I applied for it. I was confident I was going to get it. And I didn't. I was disappointed and I was frustrated. I was angry. But the truth is, God wanted me back in the local church, and here I am. If ever I write a book, and I won't, there's too many books out there, (laughs) and they all basically say the same thing. The writer of Ecclesiastes is right. There's nothing new under the sun. But if ever I did, it would be called The Reluctant Pastor. I have tried three or four times to set this burden down. I don't know what burden you're carrying, but... If you can't seem to set it down, if it keeps coming back time and time again, the odds are God is asking you to take a step in faith. So I didn't get that job. What is it that you didn't get? What want, need, or desire is unfulfilled in your life? Can you look into that with the eyes of this message and ask yourself, is God trying to lead me in a direction I just don't want to go? The truth is, God is trying to write an incredible story in your life. You just have to be willing to give him the pen. He won't force it out of your hands. He will work his sovereign will around your choices. But you will not change God's mind. And you need to let him change your heart. Scene three. God sent an angel to shepherds working the night shift. What did he say to them? Same thing he said to Joseph and Mary. What was it? Don't be afraid. Fear is your enemy. He says, I bring you good news of a great joy for all the people. Today a Savior has been born to who? You. Okay. All right. Personalize it. The Savior is Christ the Lord, and this will be your sign. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying where? in a manger. Did you know that Christ wants to be born in the manger of your heart right now? And the cloth you must wrap him in has nothing to do with wool or cotton. It has to do with trust and obeying. So why this special invitation to shepherds? I understand Mary. I understand Joseph. You know, in the Old Testament, shepherds, I've heard too many sermons. I've preached sermons where I said, you know, shepherds are these low lives. They weren't invited to the Christmas party. They are smelly. All of that's true. But you know the story of the shepherd, the common person, is key throughout your Bible. In the Old Testament, Abel. Anybody ever heard of Abel? He was a shepherd. How about Abraham? Heard of Abraham? Shepherd Isaac? Shepherd Jacob? Rachel? Moses? David? They were all shepherds. Jesus describes himself in John 10, 11. Read it. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Providence. 
Providence is God's divine guidance and care. The announcement of the Messiah's birth was not to the priests or Herod's royal house or the rich landowners of Judea. It was to shepherds, common folks just like us. Politicians and generals, kings and tyrants, the rich and powerful, lead this world to war. Peace, shalom, is God's nature and his desire for us it's his providential care. In World War II on Christmas Eve, the men doing the fighting and dying declared their own peace. They laid down their arms and they walked into no man's land. Listen to the song once more and understand that this is God's providential care on the battlefield of your life. praise team comes and takes the stage. Bow your heads for prayer, would you? Heavenly Father, we were born into this world, a, war that it's a world that is at war. Help us to lay down our own arms and trust in your plan, your sovereign will for each of our lives. We pray for peace in this world, in a world that is at war, a world in which people's homes and lives are being blown apart. We pray for peace in the church, the church at large, divided by denominations and by doctrine. We pray for peace in our nation, a nation that has become so polarized that it doesn't matter what you say after you identify as a Republican or a Democrat. We pray for peace in our homes. Sometimes that battlefield is a husband and a wife, a parent and a child or a grandchild, a brother or sister. Father, we pray that we will understand what the Prince of Peace came to do. He came to teach us to put away the sword and to not live our plan by our might, but to trust in your might so that we might live into your plan. And pr Father, we know that for any of that to happen, peace must begin in each of our individual hearts. So we give you permission right now to rearrange the furniture in our thinking, in our beliefs, in our structure, so that we will become more like the Christ. We give you permission to mess with us this Christmas and to make us more like Mary and Joseph, more like the shepherd that you've called us to be, to love the ones that you've placed in our life with a love that sees not the fault but hopes for the future in your plan. And all God's kids said, Amen. Amen.
going to go ahead and close our service with Waymaker. Jesus is the way. Sunday in Advent when we focus on peace and how genuine peace is part of God's providential plan, his love and care for each of us. Now you take from this time together a sense that you were called not only to join the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, but to become part of that movement. Go forth healed to heal. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's kids said, Amen. Amen. I'll see you Saturday night. Bring a friend. That is who you are. That is